Hope you brought a Bible to Sunday school this morning. Bring a Bible to Sunday school. I'm glad I listened to my teachers in school when they were teaching me my numbers because I love studying numbers and that's what we're going to do this morning. Numbers are like other symbols in the Bible, like the, the symbolism of the blood, symbolism of the lamb, the symbolism of um, the rivers, like the River Jordan, uh, the symbolism of baptism, just anything in the Bible that is a symbol. Passover, the holidays, the feast days, those are all the, what the Bible calls shadows. It calls them um, in samples, it calls them examples. It calls them um, allegories. Uh, in this case, the allegories are true. They're not, they're not make-believe stories. They're not fables. The Bible, it actually uses the word fables, but it says we have not used cunningly devised fables. A fable is a made-up story. That was the conversation I had with uh, the Jehovah's Witness on my door one day when we got into a talk about hell and um, they said that that was a fable that Jesus was telling. I said, no, it was a parable. And they said, well, it's still, it was a, a make-believe story that I said, no. The Bible didn't say, suppose there was a certain rich man, or let's make believe there was a certain, or pretend like there was a certain. The Bible says there was a certain rich man certain rich man and Jesus knew who it was just because he didn't name his name but he knew who it was and he knew the the poor man that ate the crumbs up from under his table his name was Lazarus Jesus knew him too and um, so anyway just like anything in the Bible has a symbolism to it trees water clouds now all these things are there in the Bible for our learning so are the numbers and I've mentioned this before but I don't think too much in Sunday school first time I really felt like God was telling me to study numbers I didn't want to do it um, because I had studied some things in the occult and in my mind that was borderline numerology and numerology is how can I explain express that numerology is similar to astrology it's the idea that random numbers can determine your fate like in astrology the position of the planets and the stars and the alignment of the Sun the moon and all of these things that they determine what's going to happen to you in other words the stars are in charge is what that literally what that means and it's the same with numerology if you use numerology as a divination tool in other words that if I were to take you know two pair of monopoly dice and throw them out and do something weird with the numbers and I could make it basically say anything you want um, and that's going to determine your fate that's that's something entirely different but the symbolism of the numbers is plainly given to us in the scriptures. The Bible always explains then what a number means, like the number seven. That's the easiest one, is that because we have seven days in a week, we know that one already. When, when you have seven days, it's finished, it's over with, it's done. Um, and you can take that all through the scriptures. They, they, God uh, separated out certain of the feast days based upon the number seven. Um, he put Judah and Benjamin in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. Uh, in Daniel 9, he mentions seven things that he's going to do for Israel, and they all have to do with the forgiveness of sins, permanent forgiveness of sins. And so seven is a holy number. Um, God sanctified the Sabbath day. The word Sabbath is a Hebrew word meaning seven. So it's a... It's a it, des it describes holiness, it describes completion, perfection. Uh, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. 
So the Bible then is going to tell you in each case what the particular number means. And in this case here, Revelation chapter 7, we're dealing with uh, specific numbers of 12 and variables of 12, or let's say, um, what's the math term? Not variables. Huh? Multiples, yeah, that was the word I was looking for. Multiples of 12, 12, 12,000. When you have 12 times 12,000, you get 144,000. And um, we see that later on, I think, in uh, Revelation 14. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention something here. And I'm not in any way trying to be mean, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to warn the people of this church. Um, a former member here um, who, if you remember, I preached a message about him um, here a while back uh, because he's the guy that beat up Cameron Pennington or tried to beat up Cameron Pennington. And um, here this guy is in his, what, late 30s, something like that. And he takes a 19-year-old boy out who had just gotten married and get, makes him lay down on the ground and he jumps on him and starts hitting him. Well, Cameron gave it back to him worse than he was getting it. And um, when I found that out, it made me very, very angry. And um, I preached a message about this guy called the bully. And after I found out about it, I got Cameron's permission. And I preached a message about him. And I'm warning you, this guy's dangerous. He's very, very dangerous. And he targets people from this church. You're not the first time that's happened. Lynn, he, he, has, he has gone to what he calls street preaching. But it's not, it's not street preaching. He stands over here by Walmart and he yells at everybody that car he yells at every car that goes by. But if he sees that it's somebody that goes to church here, he really launches after him. He's de he did it to Lynn this morning. Scared her to death. Scared her to death. He's done it to Matthew. He's done it to other people and I'm just don't engage with him. Don't talk to him. And if, if he's out there and he sees you and he comes over to your car and you don't feel comfortable, call 911. Okay? Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that if he'd have kept his hands off Cameron. But I know he's dangerous. So I'm just warning you, don't engage with him. Stay away from him. Walk big circle around him and pray for him, okay? Um, because not none, none of what he's doing brings honor to the name of Jesus Christ. It doesn't. It doesn't bring honor to our Lord. Um, the world looks at that and says that's how those people are. Well, that's not true. That's not true. And uh, so just pray for him. And uh, like I say, if um, especially our ladies and our older ladies, um, if he sees you and he remembers you from here, he will. I, and I'm not happy about what I heard happen this morning, Sister Lynn, and I appreciate you telling me that. So anyway, um, if you, like I say, if he encounters you, and he starts on with you in some way or some form and you don't feel comfortable, just call the police in. I'm not, I don't want him arrested. Um, but he's unstable, in my opinion. And um, <clears throat> so just uh, that's what the police say. The police say that's what we're here for. Am I right, Cubby? It's what they're there for. OK, instead of you trying to handle it yourself, let them deal with it. OK. All right. Uh, anyway, back to Revelation chapter 7, verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending 
from the east, having the seal of the living God. Uh, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So <clears throat> when we look at that, uh, in fact, we look at the uh, very next verse there. Uh, in verse five of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. And obviously, if you break the number down, 144, you divide that up by the number of tribes there are, then you get, it's basically 12,000 times 12, 144,000, all right? So anyway, you break that down, 144,000, 12,000, then down to the number 12. So if I were to ask you this morning, in your opinion, um, what do you think the number 12 represents in the Bible? Anybody? First thing pops in your head. Huh? Twelve disciples. So, right. So what God did in the Old Testament with twelve tribes, he does it equally in the New Testament with the twelve apostles. Okay? So, and the tribes are of Israel. And this is something that uh, I had a conversation with uh, Brady when he was still a Jehovah's Witness. And of course, Jehovah's Witness believe that the best of the Jehovah's Witness, the very, very best of them, were the 144,000. And, and if you're not in the 144,000, you never get to go to heaven. I don't know if you knew that or not, but if you're not... Of the 144,000, you don't get to go to heaven. What they say, though, is a consolation prize for you is that you get a free Monopoly game and you get an eternity on earth to play it with. So you can live on the earth, the new earth, and you can play the Monopoly game for eternity. You just can't go to heaven because that's reserved for the 144,000. So I asked Brady this, when, like I say, when he was still a Jehovah's Witness, I said, so let me ask you a question. If you were, let's say that you were good enough to be the part of the 144,000, what tribe would you be? And he didn't have an answer. I, and he, he, I said, because clearly it says... That there are 12,000 from Judah, 12,000 from Reuben, 12,000 from Gad. And it does that with all 12 tribes. So, if you were part of the 144,000, what tribe would you be from? And his answer was, well, those are spiritual tribes. And a lot of people use that word spiritual as in does not exist. It's a thought thing. But it's not real. It's only a symbol. It's only a metaphor. So therefore, I'm still right. In other words. And I said, well, but that's not what it says. And if we're going to get our doctrine from the Bible, then let's get it from the Bible. But if you're not, and, and I would say this um, to any pastor who was part of the what's called replacement theology which says that we as the Gentiles now are Israel. We have replaced the Jewish people as God's favored people. And um, God has no more of a blessing or benefit awaiting the Jewish people than he does for anybody else. That's not true. It's totally not true. And we're going to get into that later on in this same chapter. Because it's clear to me there are two different groups in this chapter. I've mentioned that before. So we do have, we have the 12 tribes, the Old Testament, 12 apostles, 
for those of us in the New Testament, we're saved by grace, okay? Um, but even at that, us in this Gentile age, we have to be careful to not to do what Paul warned us about, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, for some of you say, I am of Apollos. Some of you say, I am a Cephas. Some of you say, I am of Paul. Some of you say, I am of Christ. And Paul says, is Christ divided? Uh, is there only salvation through the Apostle Paul? No. Okay. We're, it, it is Paul that planteth, Apollos watereth, but God is the one who bringeth up the increase. That's what he said. So anyway, um, somebody else, give me a, what you think the number 12 might stand for. Come on, you can do it. Go out to your car, take another sip of coffee. Well, let's find out, shall we? Turn to Genesis 12. Since I don't have 12 fingers, I have to do this twice. And I'm very glad I don't have 12 fingers. Yeah, I'd be a giant. That's right. <clears throat> If you, if you follow the order of the book of Genesis, you, you'll see the, the number meanings. Now, I won't, I won't go all the way through that this morning. Um, number five is the number for death. And in Genesis five, everybody dies. Okay. Except Enoch. He breaks the pattern. Um, number seven is for completion. Genesis seven, God ends the earth. Number eight. It's the number for new beginnings, new life, new beginnings. And in Genesis 8, eight people walk off the ark into a new world. Okay? So, number 10 is for dominion. Um, and if you look in Genesis 10, the very first king is mentioned. In uh, verse 8 and 9, Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kauna in the land of Shinar. The number nine is the number for fruit bearing. And if you look in Genesis 9, 1, read the first verse there. Genesis 9, 1, what does it say? <clears throat> Come on, it was just one page back. Be fruitful. First, first words out of God's mouth, be fruitful. And by the way, that phrase, be fruitful, you want to take a wild guess how many times it's in the Bible? Nine times. How many fruits of the Spirit are there? Nine. Um, how many months does a woman carry a child? Well, nine months before and then four years after. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Come on, you can walk. <laughs> um, let's see. And so that brings number 11 is the number for confusion. And look in Genesis 11, you have the Tower of Babel. And God confounded their languages. He confused their tongues. So now we're in Genesis 12. And God gives the meaning now, the number 12. Now, and there's more to it, but I, I won't. I say I won't. I might. Depends on. We'll see. What'd you say? Yeah, I might. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram. And I want you to notice that he's Abram here, not Abraham. Say, so what's the difference? The name change, um, when God gives you a new name, that shows your salvation. We say, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Uh, in the book of, Re well, the book of Revelation, we studied, uh, to him that overcometh will I give him a white stone and a new name written therein. Christ has a, a new name that no man knows. So this is before Abram becomes Abraham. God gave him this promise before Abram or Abraham ever took Isaac and offered him up for a burnt offering. So God is making this promise to Abram. Get thee out of thy country. The country symbolically, is the world we live in now. The 
Paul said in, I think it was in Hebrews, that in, uh, yeah, Hebrews 11, that they all sought after a country. But here on earth, they never found it. Abraham sought for a country. And yes, God gave him a land, but that wasn't the end of it. The real country that we're going to go to is heaven. It's the new place. Amen? That's where they don't know you up there, know all the stuff you used to do. So you can take on a new name, a whole new identity, and they won't know all the stuff you used to do. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house. And think about that. Think about the people that left the land of their nativity. Abraham did it. Uh, Ruth did it. Uh, when she was from Moab, her and Orpah, they were from Moab. And when Naomi's husband died and then her two sons died, they're in Moab. And Na uh, Naomi's going to go back to her people. And she tells Orpah and Ruth, you stay here in Moab with your people. I'm going to go back. Basically, and I'm an old lady. I'm going to go back and die. But Ruth decides to stay with her. Whither thou goest, I will go. And so she leaves the land of her nativity. God calls us always to come out from among them and be ye separate. Come out means that we were in there at one time. You remember those days when you were amongst the heathen, you were with the sinners, you were doing things you shouldn't do. And now God has called us not to stay in Babylon, not to stay in Sodom, but to come out from there and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. I'll be a father unto you and you shall be my children. So that's the idea there. And I will make it, verse 2, and I will make of thee a great nation. That nation is the nation of believers. A nation, the Greek word for nation is ethnos. And it's where we get the word ethnic. So when God says, I will make of thee a great nation... Right here, the way I see it, he's already explaining the idea of a new birth. Because it would be like what Jesus said, or yeah, who said this? Can a, Yeah, Jesus. Can a leopard change his spots? Can a leopard become a lion? Can a leopard become a crocodile? No. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? No. So we can't just by thinking, change ourselves into a new creation, can we? We can't just by thinking and add a cubit to our stature. That's 18 inches at least. We can't do that. So can we change ourselves into the image of Christ? No, have to be born again in order for that to happen. That new birth, that's what makes us then a different nation, a great nation. And it's the same for the Jew as well as the Gentile. The Jews don't get um, points off for being Jewish. They're under the same law and the same curse and under the same curse of death. That we are. But he said, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will, watch this now. I will bless them that bless thee. And curse him that curseth thee. And in thee, Paul quoted this verse too. In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Who's he talking about when he says, in thee? Christ was already in the loins of Abraham, the Bible says. In fact, the, I've, I remember reading this and I'm just going, man, that blows my mind. Levi, the Paul says this, Levi was already in the loins of Abraham when Abraham paid tithes to uh, Melchizedek. 
the king of Salem, the high priest. When Paul is explaining tithing and so on and a change in the law, he said Levi is nothing special because Levi paid tithes to someone even greater than himself. How did he do it? He did it when he was in the loins of Abraham. And when Abraham paid tithes, so did Levi. That's how God sees it. So already in Abraham is Christ. Okay? And he said, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So, God makes here an unconditional promise. What I mean by that is, is there anything that God said to Abram that you must do in order for me to give you this new land, make of you a great nation, bless you, bless your family, and then bless all the families of the earth through you. Is there anything that Abram had to do? No. And did he go? Yes. So which comes first? Your works or your faith? Your faith does. I've had people try to tell me that Abram was saved by works. Noah was saved by works. How so? Noah had to build the ark in order to be saved. He was saved by works. Oh, no, 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 no. Before Noah ever built an ark, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So, in my humble opinion, in, in this sense here, the number 12 represents the number for God's promise. Okay? And let's look at that through the scriptures. Genesis 24. That's 12 chapters later. Just 12 chapters later. We have a promise. Abraham was old in verse 1. And well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest son, eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. We talked about that when we were in Genesis. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And when we get to Isaac, we're going to find out that God made the exact same promise to him that he did with Abram or, yeah, Abram. We'll go 12 more chapters to Genesis 36. We have another blessing, a promise of a blessing. That's what I should be saying. The promise of a blessing in Genesis 36. So Genesis 12, Genesis 24, Genesis 36. And notice this, verse 40. These are the names of the dukes that came of Esau, according to their families, after their places, by their names. Duke Timna, Duke Alva, Duke Jephthah, Duke Aholabama. I thought that said Barack Obama for a minute. Duke Elah, Duke Pinion, Duke Kenaz, Duke Timan, Duke Mibzar, and Duke Magdiel, Duke Iram, these be the dukes of Edom according to their inhabitations in the land of their possession. He is Esau, the father of the Edomites. And there's 12 dukes. And did not when, you remember when Jacob went in to steal the father's right hand eldest son blessing, pretending to be Esau. And uh, Isaac gave it to him. Jacob leaves, Esau comes in, Father, have you not a blessing for me? If you go read um, what um, Isaac said to Esau, it's almost identical to what he said to Jacob. But he said that Jacob's dominion has to come off of you. But basically, it's the blessing or the promise of a blessing. Twelve, a duke basically is seen as like a prince or a governor or some sort of ruler. And here you have the number 12 again. That denotes a promise. Um, I like this stuff. 
all forms of the word covenant. In other words, covenant, covenanted, covenants, and covenant breakers. That's, let's see, one, two, three, four. Four different forms with the word covenant in it. It's found 300 times in the King James Bible, and that's exactly 12 times 25. And then we go back to Genesis 12. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee. That's the 300th verse of the Bible, which again is 12 times 25. It looks to me like it's in a perfect place. It's in the exact right position. The word promise in the New Testament is mentioned 72 times. That's 12 times 6. The 144th verse, which is 12 times 12 of the Bible, is Genesis 6, 6. And God said, it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. But we know then that later on, God is making a promise that there will be a new one. Genesis 6, 3 the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. Yet his days and here he's here again, he's making a promise again. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. That's twelve times ten. In verse 18, same chapter, Genesis six. But with thee will I establish my covenant. Here again, we have the promise of a blessing. I will establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark. Thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. Since I'm mentioning and talking about symbolism, any kind of covenant like that, they call this the uh, Noah's covenant. They, they talk about the Abrahamic covenant, uh, the Davidic covenant. God makes covenants with various people throughout the scriptures. And anytime you see God making a covenant like that with people, especially for the good, all of those are a picture of the new covenant. He says here again, but with thee will I establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark. So this is a promise then of salvation. Was Noah and his family saved while everybody else perished? And what saved them? Well, grace did through faith because since it had not rained on the earth and nobody else could imagine that it would ever rain on the earth, Noah's doing something here that no one's ever done before. He's building a boat. He's building a great ark and he's doing it out of faith. It wasn't that he heard a weather report and said, well, I reckon we ought to get in the boat and get ready. He did so out of faith and God made a covenant with him and said, because you believe what I said, the moment you get on that ark, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep you. Nothing is going to happen to you. You and your sons and their wives and your wife, you're all going to walk off that ark. Every animal that you took on the ark, they're going to walk off the ark. I'm going to preserve seed through that ark. And that ark is Christ. Think of it this way. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. Old things, the old world had passed away. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Oh. This is the, um, the Ark, it's called the Ark Experience, it's out in Kentucky. And if you get a chance to go, I would say go. It is, the, you were with us, weren't you? Poor Matthew. We parked, and we're walking up to this thing, and I'm just going... I can't believe that. I mean, it was huge to think about it. And they built it according to their understanding of the 
the measurements of the ark. And as you go, and when you go inside this thing, they've got exhibits and, you know, they, they built the inside the way we would imagine, you know, cages and stalls for the animals and this and that and the other. Um, the guy that, uh, got this project going, Kent Ham, who is a creationist, once he had it built, he invited Bill Nye, the science guy, over to do a tour of it. And of course, they're into it non-stop at each other. Okay? Non-stop. And of course, Bill Nye, the science guy, is having none of it. You know, he thinks this is all make-believe stuff like that. But anyway, that arc was 300 cubits long, which is 12 times 25. That shows God's covenant. Um, the dimensions of the ark were 300 by 50 by 30. And that measures out to be 450,000 cubits squared. Now, I just used a calculator. I'm not a mathematician. But that breaks down to 144 times 3,125 or 12 times 12 times 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 times 5. Now, there will be a quiz when the bell rings. Okay? Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. This is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, the height of it 30 cubits. Everything's perfect with God. And everything has a meaning with God. How many, how many levels were there on here? How many stories was it? Huh? No, not 12. That's too easy. So if the ark is Christ, and the number three represents what? Yeah, the Godhead. So that Paul said, for in him, meaning Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Isn't that something? Father, Word, Holy Ghost. And that's our salvation. Okay, here's your quiz. How long was the ark? Wrong. How long was the ark? 300 cubits. It's up there on the screen. <laughs> Those of you watching, pray for me. See what I got to deal with here? Okay. It's like training monkeys by putting a banana on a button. Okay. I mean, that's basically what it is. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I mean this. Do, re, do, pray, do pray for this young man, okay? Pray for his wife. And um, I mean him no harm. But just, just be careful, okay? Be careful. Father, we love you and we love your word. There, there is no end. There is absolutely no end to the depth that's in this Bible. There's no, it is absolutely infinite. There is application after application, allegory, type after type, picture after picture. Father, every, every page we look on somewhere has Christ in it somehow or his salvation or, Father, I just love this book and I love teaching it. Pray, Father, that you'd bless your people this morning. Help us to understand these deep things of God. And enjoy them, Father, because this Bible is rich with wonderful things like this. Oh, taste and see that the, that the Lord is good. So, Father, bless your word. May it be sweeter than honey going into our mouth, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.